I feel like that's something that I'm trying to do myself with the drum set by playing with brushes, mallets, different roots, sticks, obviously, uh, different tunings and using different cymbals to try and get a hip hop feel, but still have it sound acoustic so that you realize that you're in a situation where you're listening to a jazz trio, but out of nowhere, they can emulate something. That was New York City jazz drummer Damion Reed discussing what he thinks that his and his bandmate and bandleader Robert Glasper's contributions to the language of jazz have been. Minel Symbols' Gabriel Harris recently sat down with Damion to discuss a variety of things. Some of the questions and answers got kind of heavy, but all of it in a friendly and good way. We had a pretty good time, and we hope you enjoy the podcast. I'm your host, Chris Brewer, and this is Minel Radio. I want to welcome everyone in to our podcast here. Today we have Mr. Damian Reed. Hello, how is everyone? Damian has been playing with the Robert Glasper Trio. Uh, Also played with Steve Lehman, Greg Osby. I think a lot of people will know you from the Robert Glasper Trio. Most likely, yes. So on that uh, line of thinking... You've been playing with Robert Glasper for several years now. Yes. Some of the best-known jazz pianists all have drummers associated with them, like Herbie Hancock and Tony Williams, Keith Jarrett and Jack DeJohnette, Bill Evans and Paul Motion. And I would say each of those duos made significant contributions to the jazz language. So what do you think the contribution that you and Robert have made is or will be on the jazz language? Wow, that's a heavy question. I think thus far we have contributed our personal, I guess, takes on hip hop influence, R and B hip fluent, excuse me, R and B influence in the modern era uh, with drum machines and samples. And Robert has done a lot of production with hip hop artists and R&B artists. And he's also involved in a lot of hybrid projects that combine jazz and hip hop. His acoustic trio that I'm in, I think has influenced maybe a lot of musicians to try it in an acoustic setting, rather than thinking that they have to always use some sort of digital instruments or some sort of, you know, you know, for instance, keyboards all the time, or playing with an MPC, or always having an MC rap, or something like that, to infer the hip-hop influence. I feel like Robert has explored how to make the piano sound like it's fabricated, or like it's an actual sample, or by playing with the three pedals and his touch and everything else. I feel like that's something that I'm trying to do myself, with the drum set by playing with brushes, mallets, different roots, sticks, obviously, uh, different tunings and using different cymbals to try and get a hip hop feel, but still have it sound acoustic so that you realize that you're in a situation where you're listening to a jazz trio, but out of nowhere, they can emulate something or transition into another feel or another. So I feel that's what we have contributed thus far and i feel like who knows what will happen in the future like where our influence will go or where we'll peak or where we'll continue so that part i don't i don't necessarily know where we'll end up but i think if we continue to stay creative and challenge ourselves i I feel like sky's the limit for that like specific trio with robert and vicente that's very cool as far as having symbols to emulate sounds heard not in jazz, hip-hop, like you said. Mm -hmm. What specifically um, would you pick out symbol-wise or would you do that would be different from just a regular jazz trio? You know, when you have symbol samples on a keyboard or on a drum machine, you know, you could control the decay. So that is a way of controlling the decay is, is, you know, uh, like if someone wants a very short or sharp like a hi hat sound, you know they, you know you could obviously keep the hi hat clothes really tight, but if you have symbols that lean towards being drier, you've already cut resonance and cut the decay. So little things like that, um, uh, having 
you know, there's a old way that a lot of drummers in the church or even in hip hop used to just put a splash on a snare drum, for instance, to create a clap sound so that when the snare vibrates, the cymbal vibrates. That emulates more so an electronic clap or something, you know, so you have this acoustic you know, sound, you know, of a wood drum or, or an alloy drum being hit, and then you have a cymbal on top that vibrates, which is this metallic sound. And I feel like those sounds lean towards any type of modern music that's using samples or keyboards. Another sound would, would, would actually be uh, certain crashes that are also really quick or uh, have like this, 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 uh, you know these weird frequencies that 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 may sound like static or something like that, but or by using tambourines in conjunction with cymbals or jingles and you know just to because a lot of production now is layered. You have kibasas, tambourines, different things layered on top of the actual hi hat. So if you can do all that at once by putting some sort of percussion with and then you know you know the hi hat or you know just things like that. For example, that's just for example. Right, that and that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I've seen a lot of guys putting putting more things on the hi hat, mm -hmm. like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying that's to emulate the yeah, layering. it's to emulate production. Okay, sticking with the hip hop theme because you, you mentioned that you feel like uh, the signature that the Robert Glasper trio has is being both jazz and hip-hop at the same time. Do you think that is a bigger reflection on the fact that your generation grew up listening to hip-hop and you're thereby influenced by it when you go to create your own music? Or do you think that it's in some way trying to be relevant to younger listeners today to draw them into the jazz? I personally feel like it's both. I feel like your first, uh, you know, the first part to your question, yes, myself and others that are my age, we did grow up listening to hip hop. So of course, our every day was listening to that music and then we would go and listen to older music from the 60s, 50s, 40s and learn that tradition and then have to learn how to play that way. But then we still in our iPods or in our Walkmans or in our cars or whatever, we were listening to hip hop or rock or whatever was going on. That was modern, that was current. Like for instance, I went to high school in the 90s. So whatever that was current then. As an artist, I can't help but be influenced by my environment. So that's definitely true. The second part of your question, I do think that musicians want to bring younger audiences to their shows because they understand that even though, for instance, for lack of a better term, we're jazz musicians, the audience is generally 40 and up or 50 and up. That will primarily be at your shows, that will buy your records, that will buy your tickets to actually come and watch you perform. So when you're traveling the world within Europe, Asia, and the States, and you generally see older people, you start saying, well, man, you know, sometimes I want to see people that, that are my age that, that can appreciate the fact that I'm doing it basically an old American tradition, plus I'm playing some things that they could relate to. And I also want to show them that it's all related. With Black American music, there's kind of a it's just it's kind of streamlined. A lot of the things are interchangeable by decade. It, it, it just doesn't matter. The genre is just used to sell it. So I think for sure uh, the likes of Robert, myself and others, you know, we would like to see more younger people at our shows. And that is why we're not stifled or scared to incorporate things that we like, because we know if we like them, and we try our best to create in a certain manner and bring these elements forward, others will probably notice that and be drawn to it. So most definitely. One of the elements of your drumming that stands out to me is that you play a lot of broken beats. 
Where did that come from, and how did you develop that into your signature style? I like rhythms that are, I guess, uh, I guess you can say they they entice the soloist. So when I listen to a saxophonist or a pianist while I'm playing or a trumpeter or whatever, and there's this dialogue and there's this call and response going on. So for me, most saxophonists and most pianists are always playing extremely fast passages. They're playing within the 16th note grid or 32nd note grid or playing some sort of hemiola. So for me, I always felt like if I played different hemiolas, you know, different rhythms to engage and provoke certain things out of the soloist or to counter what they were doing. So I feel like those ideas became busier. They became also listening to electronica and metal and all these other uh, genres that have a lot more notes within them. So using some of those passages and liking the way that those things sound on the kit and, and not being constricted and thinking that they could only be utilized in one genre. No, bring those elements over to a genre that I'm playing and hopefully entice the soloist to go in other you know, directions. Or if, if they are forcing me to go in another direction, I'll go in that direction. So I'm not afraid to engage on the same plane rhythmically with some of these soloists. I think that's why I play those rhythms is because you know, most of the time people think that you know, a drummer, timekeeper, just keep time, lay it down, you know, make sure it feels good. All that is true, and all that is definitely <laughs> an objective of the drummer. But on top of that, when you're improvising, I think it's important to also see what type of information you can invoke out of the band. And so that's why I think those ideas started to come. I, I just wanted to play rhythms that I felt would make somebody think like, oh, well, you know, what's that? Oh, okay. Or... It might have just been a complete mirror effect. I'm just playing maybe a phrase that's an uh, inversion of what you just did. So if someone's playing a fast passage where it's like a quintuplet over something, and I play something that's broken between three different sounds on the drum kit, it might sound different because you're hearing it from a drummer as opposed to a pianist or a saxophonist. So that's how I think that concept or that language that I'm trying to... Uh, play on the kit came about was through that type of energy was how to have a dialogue with soloists and other instrumentalists and not just become just a foundation but also engage them you know yeah and and that's great that that makes me think of the uh, famous miles davis second quintet and i've read that what set them apart, and I'm talking with Herbie Hancock, mm -hmm. Ron, Ron Carter on bass, mm -hmm. Tony Williams, Wayne Shorter, mm -hmm. what set them apart was that you did not just have a rhythm section <laughs> playing underneath of a soloist, exactly. but that the whole band was actually soloing together. And I remember last year I came and saw you with Robert at the Village Vanguard, and I remember that was one of my takeaways after that show was that there was no one person just soloing at any one time. It was it was as if the three of you guys were all moving together throughout the, the song or the piece that you were playing. Most definitely. I mean, that's, that's, that's the objective of improvising within a group is you're all I mean you, you might have you know for instance the bass player might have a written bass line I might have a written drum part you know there's probably a melody and certain chords that a pianist would have to play after you state all that and then you say there's a solo section everyone's improvising but you have to understand what are the parameters of what you need to do so that you showcase who is soloing versus like you know if it's a piano solo and the drummer's just going mad that might be something that you know someone might appreciate but it might not illuminate the piano at that moment in time so i think everyone is always soloing it's not just oh okay it's your turn now and okay who's next it's your turn everyone's always thinking of new ways to play information that will uplift the music or push the music forward even if you are playing just time how do you change the feel on the hi-hat or on the ride or are you going to, you know, you were playing like upbeats that were eighth notes. Now, 
Are you switching to triplets? You know, just just that conscious decision is improvisation and it also influences the band. So you're kind of always soloing. It's just, are you going to get in the way? Or are you going to try to support, you know, or are you going to try and have a dialogue? I think that's where the decisions on how that happens. But I think, you know, when you feel like we're all soloing, that's one thing. But I just look at it as we're all creating simultaneously to create something to hopefully support whoever is at that moment in time the lead soloist. You know what I mean? And would you say that the fact that it's improvised music is what makes it jazz and not hip hop or pop or funk or R&B or something Technically, else? yeah. I mean, that exactly. I mean, because if if you hear most of the songs that are within the genres you just named, hip hop, pop, rock, you know, you don't hear a lot of information coming from the drummer and the bass player all the time. But one, one thing I find interesting is like, if you listen to old Motown recordings, James Jamerson is the only one who's actually improvising the most, I think, right? Because he's playing the bass line, but he's playing all these runs and all these riffs in the middle. But if it wasn't for the drummer holding down the beat or the horn section continuing to play their riffs, then it probably wouldn't be as impactful. So. Yes, I think people take turns on who's going to get more free or who's going to interpret at this moment in time. So I think what makes people think of jazz immediately is that they don't hear the melody constantly or they don't hear a passage that is cyclical. It's just, it's just constantly moving. They, you know, they, they feel like every time you know, the head comes around, there's a new idea being you know, introduced. And so for them, it's like, okay, there's more information. So they don't look at a song. Be like, for instance, My Favorite Things, when you hear the original and then you hear Coltrane's version, it's the same song. The only difference is that each time Coltrane goes through the song, he's interpreting the melody differently. He's phrasing differently. You know, he's trying to build on something that he created, but he's still playing the exact same song. You know, McCoy might play different chords or Elvin might at that moment in time play like a different rhythm, you know, that he, you know, didn't do on the last chord. So I feel like the amount of information, the amount of notes being played, I think automatically makes people think of, of, uh, of this is jazz. But it's funny because when I think of also another notey music like metal, for instance, the drummer is playing a lot of notes with his feet. And the guitar player is like playing all these crazy like you know passages. The bass player is maybe holding down like you know the hits. And for me, it feels the it's, it, feel, it feels like it's coming from the same place. It's just it's just because the what there's it feels more aggressive, or because it's louder, or because the vocalist is singing a certain way. You don't think of it as jazz, but and then there's and then there'll be a guitar solo, right? Or you know what I mean later on in the piece. So for me, it's 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 just because maybe within the genre of jazz, there's a lot more improvisation than other genres. And people are also more prone to like a song if there's a vocalist or if there's lyrics. You know, so when that happens, the intuitive musical choice is to support that, which means play less. Because that's how you allow a vocalist or the lyrics to be heard, is to play less. But when there's not a vocalist, and let's say a horn player is playing the exact same melody that a singer would have sang, now you get more activity from the band because there's more freedom. You know, the, the, or, And that's why certain vocalists within jazz made it an objective to constantly push themselves and engage with the musicians so that their voice wasn't inhibited to just, you know what I mean, just to be just someone singing a song. They actually wanted to get in there with the musicians, and if a piano player played you know, an alternate chord, they could hear that and sing the same melody to that chord. Or if a drummer or a bass player played a different rhythm, they could actually get into the groove of that rhythm and sing what they were about to sing, but sing it within the vein of what the rhythm section is doing. So I feel like because that activity happens more often within the jazz genre, that's why whenever people hear a lot more notes, they immediately think jazz. That's just my opinion.
Well, I think you have a very common background and starting place on drums like a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. I know you started playing drums in church as a kid, followed by drumming lessons. Then you went to music school, moved to New York, so on and so forth. But I think the big difference for you is that you had a drum teacher who was Billy Higgins, Mm -hmm. who... If anyone is listening and they don't know, Billy is considered the most recorded drummer in jazz music. Most definitely. Your father is Richard Reed, who played bass. He mm-hmm. was a working bass player. Still still, still alive, yeah. <laughs> still alive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my question is, what was it that you learned from either Billy or your father or another musician from that generation what wisdom did they give you and and what did you learn that you feel like maybe changed the course of your career or perhaps put you on a course that led you to where you are today that's a great question i would say it was when i you know attempted playing or or would play with my dad and other you know uh, you know musicians his colleagues they all spoke about being yourself. It's one of the main things. So when I hear that, I just think about what I would do, what I would think about, what I want. It, it, it becomes somewhat selfish, I guess, because being yourself means it's your ideas. There's no one else on the planet like you. So that, that seems to be the energy or the spirit behind a lot of the music that the elders that I grew up around were really going for because they didn't want to sound like anybody else, individually or collectively. They wanted what they were doing to be unique. And so that perked my, I mean, it just piqued my interest. It just, it, 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 it just got me in this uh, constant stage of just looking for more things because now you're trying to not only be yourself but you're trying to find records and stuff that no one else has you know you're trying to be so unique and you know find a shirt that no one has find shoes that no one's seen you know just everything becomes like an energy like i need to be different i need to embrace my thoughts and my ideas and try and focus them and create on top of still being proficient and competent on your instrument and being able to play whatever you're asked to do. But once you do that, once the objective is met, you have to have your own sense of flair and sound with it because that's what makes you an individual or else you end up blending in because if there's one guy that sounds this way and you want to sound like him, eventually that guy is going to get called before you because everyone's just going to say you sound like him. So why not? be able to do whatever the music or whatever the composition calls for while being yourself. So not only was it enthralling to do it, but it was also a challenge, man. You know, it was it was it was like a new puzzle that had been given to. You know, when you grow up, you get jigsaw puzzles and you put them on the table and you work on them. That's one thing that is how do I listen to Elvin, Tony, Max Roach, Roy Haynes, John Bonham, you know what I mean? Like, how do I listen to these guys and not copy them, but give people an energy that maybe they might say, yeah, that makes me feel like this. But then all they could think about is, but yeah, that guy playing, he sounds, he, man, he has, he has something going on. And you don't think about someone else that was the predecessor. I think the elders that I was around, they and, and they never constricted me. They never told me not to do something. It, they just guided me when things maybe might have been not, you know, musically appropriate or something like that because it was out of place or it didn't it didn't match what was really supposed to happen. Then they would say, you know what, you know, why don't you think about this? So but I was always free. And I feel like that's what every artist wants to be free. You want to feel like whatever you do, whatever you, you think, whatever you say are your thoughts, are your ideas, and you don't want them to be influenced by anyone else, you know, or or constricted or, or hindered or whatever you want to say, you know? And 
how do you draw that line? Because I think in other genres, or I should say on other gigs, mm-hmm. it's probably easier to know when you're supposed to just play the music as it's been given to you, and and you might have a, a moment in the spotlight to shine. But trying to be your own self and trying to push the bar artistically and being an improviser in your element. How do you know where to draw that line between playing what's appropriate for the gig and pushing the artistic bar further out? Like, for instance, the swing pattern, right? Spank-a-lang, spank-a-lang. Everyone sings it, right? But if you hear Higgins play it, if you hear Roy Haynes play it, Philly Joe, Buddy Rich, Elvin, whomever, play that same exact pattern. What makes you say that's different? It's the phrasing of the same rhythm. It's the sound of the cymbal. You know what I mean? There's certain things that just stand out. So I just think you 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 have to know what's appropriate for whatever piece that you're playing. You know, so if it's a shuffle, you know, shuffle backbeat. You know, like I feel like Bernard Purdy's going to sound different than Clyde Stubblefield. You know what I mean? It's it's the same groove. What makes each version by two individuals different? It's because of how they think, how they tune, their touch, how they play. I feel like that starts taking you into your individualities because you're being true to that. But both drummers, or in any case, all the drummers that play that, you still have to know what that pattern is. You still have to know what's necessary for that music to succeed and if you don't then you're doing a disservice to the actual composition or the group or whatever it is so once you know the information that needs to be played you'll play it and you'll naturally if you're being in tune with what you need to do you'll play it differently than anyone else just because of who you are how you hear how you think but that doesn't mean that you don't have to play the same part and i feel like sometimes when we think about improvisation or whatever, we think about, oh, okay, he's just not playing a part. He doesn't know what he needs to play. He's just, like, coming off the cuff or whatever it is. But, no, it's there's parts, there's stuff that needs to be played. And once you play it, just, just imagine if Miles told Tony to play a certain pattern on the snare. It's going to sound and feel different with Tony playing it. Then replace that drummer with Jack or Elvin. Play the exact same pattern. I guarantee you'll feel something different from it. So that's kind of where I'm at with, with, with that question. You know what I mean? What is your challenge now as a drummer? And, and what are you challenging yourself with? Playing new music, you know, different, you know, different music. Like I, I personally want to, do things that I've actually never done before professionally. There might be things that I've done maybe in private, like playing with, you know, guitarists and jamming out and doing certain things or playing with percussionists or doing like different things. But now I feel like I want to put myself in situations that I've, you know, never been in before. Like for instance, in the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot more music with Cuban and Puerto Rican musicians. And they're bringing me rhythms that I've never had to play before because they're influenced by bata and all types of other, you know what I mean? Like drums and, and, and but rhythms that actually mean something in their culture that actually infer stuff and are, are meant for certain ceremonies. So when they're asking you to contribute what you do, but play certain patterns or play within the vein of this, uh, you know, certain medium that they're using, it's a challenge. And I'm glad that I've been put in those situations more. You know, I just recently did a gig with David Sanchez where all the music is influenced by Haitian drumming. And those are things that I probably have never just, you know, I've, I've listened to them before. I've got a few records and checked some things out. But now I'm being asked to do a professional gig and actually play with a drummer playing these rhythms like a percussionist and play those rhythms on the drum kit.
I have one final question for you. Jazz is the American music, mm-hmm. but sometimes it seems in in recent years that it's it's more popular in the rest of the world or in other parts of the world than it actually is here in America. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that at one point jazz was the pop music and then it fell out of being the pop music and really mm-hmm. became a music for musicians. Mm-hmm. Along with that, it's the African-American music that was started and propelled and continually pushed forward by African-Americans. And there's several cases of where Sidney Bechet lived in Europe Uh or Art Taylor Dexter Gordon moved to Europe to actually live there. Even Miles Davis said he was treated way better in Europe than he was Uh treated here at home. And my question would be for you, I know you travel outside of the States a lot to do your music. Uh So what is your take on, from a social aspect both how the music is received in the States versus the rest of the world and how the musicians are received in the States versus the rest of the world. I think the rest of the world is, uh, well, the, the rest of the world, their focus is on the art. Their focus is on something that they haven't done or something that they can't do or something that they want to do being brought to them by musicians or or artists, however you want, that are skilled and are presenting it to them. Unfortunately, it's as similar to a soldier who's African-American that fights for his country, comes back unscathed, gets a silver star instead of a medal of honor, and he's almost impoverished and he's not even treated he's treated worse at home for the country that he fought for so when you think of why does that happen why does a soldier who's african-american who fights for his country when they come home they get treated worse right when this is supposed to be the country that they're fighting for they should be treated the same they should be able to go into the same bathroom they should be able to walk into a restaurant from the same door so when you think about that concept then the the musician who's African American is essentially going to go through the same thing. You're bringing an art form that you do at home already. That's for your people at home. But when you go to fight somewhere else, you know, as a soldier, so as a, you know, musician, you go and play somewhere else, they don't have to deal with you within their society, right? So they're looking at you As an artist, someone that's doing something that they appreciate. So they immediately are judging you based off of your skill and your talent, your gift. Whereas in America, you're not really being judged on your skill and your talent solely. You're being judged on how you look first because there's a difference in this country. So I feel like that's the difference. That's at the root of the problem. That's at the root of why African-American you know, musicians could go abroad and get more appreciation for their art rather than at home. I, and that's why I use the analogy or the comparison of a soldier is because I feel like it's, it's the exact same. And I feel like it hurts for a lot of musicians because you, know, you would want to play the music at, and so, at home and get the same respect for it. So then you understand that that's why if someone does exactly what you do, in your country, and they don't look like you, then they'll probably get more accolades for it. And it's the same, I think, as if a soldier goes out and he saves his platoon and he doesn't get a Congressional Medal of Honor. But a soldier that doesn't look like him, who did the same thing, will come home with that. So that's just how this country seems to treat this this particular group of people. So I feel like other countries... It's not like racism doesn't exist in their country either. (laughs) It's just 
they feel inclined to do a different act than what they feel like you're getting at home. So if you're not appreciated at home, then hey, come on over to Paris. We'll love you for what you do. Or come to Japan or come to, you know what I mean? It's, we'll appreciate you because A, you don't live here <laughs> and we don't have to see you every day. So when you come to, to our culture and you give us what you're, you're giving us, which is your art, we will appreciate it. And also I think music appreciation, art appreciation is a little higher in other countries. You know, it's taught in schools. It's there's 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 government, you know, you know, there's government, you know, subsidies for it. You know, there's more opportunities for people to succeed as an artist abroad. So the appreciation for it is is higher. Whereas here, you're only appreciated once you have finally succeed on a major level. Then all of a sudden people say you've made it. But in France, you could collect unemployment. Whereas a musician can't collect unemployment if he was touring for a year straight and then all of a sudden he only has a couple of spot dates. He can't go to the government and say, where's that same money that I would have made? Can you give me you know, some sort of unemployment? But, uh, but someone that works in an office can get unemployment because that job is considered to be valuable. So I don't feel like an artist's job is considered valuable in, in the United States. Whereas in other places, they actually have infrastructure set up to support these artists so of course when an artist from america comes they would appreciate it because they're judging their own artists so of course they're going to judge a foreign artist so that's how i see it I want to thank you for coming in today, doing the podcast, sharing your thoughts with us. Those are some deep and heavy thoughts, but uh, we appreciate you putting your art out there. Most definitely. And continuing to push, and uh, hopefully we can keep pushing through those barriers. Most definitely. Thanks for listening to Minel Radio. If you liked this episode, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. We would appreciate it very much. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.